July 7th, 1943, one of the richest men in the world, a man by the name of Sir Harry Oakes, was found brutally murdered in his home. The murder puzzled investigators from around the globe and is regarded as one of the highest profile cold cases of all time. Now, nearly eight decades later, through months of painstaking research, interviews, and exploration, we believe we cracked the case, and in doing so, unraveled a web bigger than anyone ever could have imagined. Our story begins in the city of Nassau, on the island of New Providence, more specifically on Bay Street. What was once the epicenter of extraordinary wealth in the Bahamas is now but a shadow of its former self. Those who owned businesses on this street were some of the richest men in the world, the lifeblood of the economy, and effectively owned the Bahamas themselves. These guys were known by everyone as the Bay Street Boys, and the de facto leaders of this exclusive group were two men by the name of Harold Christie and Harry Oakes. After serving in the Royal Flying Corps in Canada during World War I, Harold Christie made his first fortune running rum for Mafia heavyweights Meyer Lansky and Lucky Luciano. Eager to expand his empire, Harold Christie moved to the Bahamas and entered the real estate game, along with his brother Frank. It wasn't long before he had cornered the entire market and accumulated an incredible amount of wealth. Harry Oakes was an American-born prospector who came upon his fortune partly due to luck. He was a stowaway on a train across Canada, but was eventually found by the conductor and kicked off, only to find himself on the fourth largest deposit of gold in all of Canada. Like many other powerful men at the time, escaping income tax, he became a British citizen and moved to the Bahamas becoming good friends with Harold Christie and working together to develop the Bahamas into the ultimate getaway destination. Oakes quickly became one of the richest and most powerful men in the world, and the Bahamas became his playground. One of their biggest projects together was the first airport in the Bahamas, named Oakes Field. It was built in a convoluted business deal in which Oakes loaned the money to Christie for the airport construction, and in turn, Christie hired Oakes as the contractor. Oakes used the money to buy all the heavy equipment, which he would operate himself to grade the runways and build the airstrips. However, Christie soon realized while Oakes Field could handle small propeller planes, if they wanted the Bahamas to be the post-war vacation empire they dreamt of, they would need an airport capable of handling large jets. So Christie and Oakes agreed to the same arrangement on an even larger airport. Oakes loaned the money to Christie like before, but this time Christie crossed him and gave the contracts to his old rum runner boss, Meyer Lansky. When he realized he had been cut out of his own deal, Oakes undoubtedly lost a lot of trust in his friend and business partner. Fast forward nearly 78 years to this day. It was July 6th, 1943. Harry Oakes had sent one of his men to Big Darby Island to confirm a delivery of a flock of sheep from Australia that Christie had assured him had arrived. The island had been used for decades as a very profitable plantation. However, when Oakes' man returned, he told Harry that there was no sheep to be found on the island. Oakes, having been double-crossed for the second time, and not the forgiving sort of man, knew exactly what had to be done. So that evening, after the other guests left the party at his Westburn estate, Oakes told Christie he was calling in all the loans he had made to him over the years and would be moving to Mexico, where he had already stashed a large percentage of his fortune. Oakes himself accounted for 80% of all of Christie's business, and Christie, unable to pay the loans and fearing the end of his empire, knew there was only one way to save himself. He called in a favor from the man he worked with in the past, the man who he awarded the second airport contract to, mob boss Meyer Lansky. Being the boss of the organized crime unit known as Murder Inc., Meyer Lansky had undoubtedly dealt with similar situations before. He also had skin in the game, as Oakes was adamantly opposed to Lansky, Christie, and the governor of the Bahamas' plan to bring a number of casinos to the Bahamas and create a massive gambling ring, only available to tourists, as it was and remains to this day illegal for native Bahamians to gamble at casinos in the Bahamas. To fix this problem at hand, that night, Lansky made a call and sent two hitmen from Miami aboard a high-speed rum runner used during the Prohibition days. According to recently unsealed case files we were able to acquire, Captain Sears, the assistant superintendent of the police, with no ties to the Bay Street Boys one way or another, testified that he had seen Christie in a station wagon on George Street at midnight on the night of the murder, directly contradicting Christie's story where he went to bed and did not leave Westbourne that night. 
It follows that Christy, or one of Christy's associates that was driving, then took them to Oak's Westbourne estate to do the hit. After being struck in the head four times with an ice pick or pickaxe, a morbid joke alluding to his prospect or past, Harry Oaks lay dead while the murderers set fire to the bedroom to destroy the evidence. They hoped that the burnt down house might suggest Oaks died by some sort of accident. On their way back to the marina, the hitman warned the night watchman at Westbourne that if he knew what was good for himself, he would disappear forever. Back at Lyford Key, however, the night watchman was less cooperative and as a result was murdered and it was staged as a suicide. After the hitman returned to Miami, Christie went back up to Westbourne, expecting to find the fire had taken hold and the mansion ablaze. But to his despair, the fire had been snuffed out, just as Oak's life was that very same night. A violent thunderstorm had blown across the island as Christie was returning the hitmen to their boat, and as a result, the wind and rain blowing through Oak's bedroom had extinguished the fire before it ever took hold. Christie went to Oak's room to see the body for himself, and as the early morning light peered through the open window, the phone in the bedroom rang. In a state of shock, Christie answered the phone. The man on the other line was Eddie Depew, editor of the Nassau Tribune and a close friend of Harry Oaks. Okay, so we're at the Nassau Tribune. We were asked to wear masks just for everyone's protection, but this is the place that reported on the murder of Harry Oaks when he was murdered in 1943. We've been given access to some of their archives, so we're about to dive in and look at them and see what we can find. Oh, the Duke gave a eulogy of Sir Harry. Wow. That's crazy. I think the guy part of his murder. The guy covered up his murder and gave his own eulogy. It's insane. So we might actually find, when looking at this, because this is when the case was only being recorded by newspeople um, from an inside-to-out perspective, we're actually going to find that it may be less substantial because they're only looking at it from the standpoint of what people like the Duke and the police chief and people like that are talking about. Um, and it was only until later that we were able to find that uh, it was actually uh, a lot of doctored evidence. So we may have to go to the Department of Record and Records and see if we can find something a little bit more substantial um, if we want to get any more clarity on this case. So well, it's just funny to see everything here. What they thought was just straight fact, we mm -hmm. now know is, you know. No, yeah, I mean, like, it's all if, you, if you look at this, it, it treats it like uh, it was just a very simple case, and Freddie did it. And in the and scheme of things, it's just a massive web, like, mm -hmm. of, of all these major players just covering up this murder. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't discuss any of the people like Axel Wenergren, it doesn't discuss Harold Christie, it doesn't discuss the Duke of Windsor's role, and it basically just treats the investigators of the case, like they were actually superior options to the Bahamian police who were right there. When in reality they were just Lansky's boys from Miami sent right. down to cover it up. I mean, this is showing firsthand how if the evidence weren't able to be examined in a new light, this case would have just been cold for 80 years and nobody would really know what actually happened. Depew was calling Oaks to see if the two of them were still on that morning to go to Darby Island to see the flock of sheep that Christie knew were non-existent. Christie, with limited options left, blurted out that he had just discovered Oaks had been murdered. Depew told Christie to call the police and after hanging up, printed the front page headline that Sir Harry Oaks had been murdered. The news quickly broke around the world announcing the murder of its richest man. It wasn't long before the first patrolman and the police commissioner himself, Colonel R.A. Erskine Lindop, arrived at the scene. The commissioner, a veteran of the job, could sense something was off right away and knew that Christie had to be involved one way or another, and leaving the scene to the patrolman, the commissioner hightailed it to the governor's mansion and told the governor what had happened. Now you might be wondering why the chief of police wouldn't just arrest Christie on the spot, or at the very least, take him in for questioning. Besides. Why would the governor of the Bahamas need to be notified in person, let alone so early in the morning? Well, the governor at the time was none other than the former King of England, the Duke of Windsor, Edward VIII. Colonel Erskine Lindop was first and foremost loyal to him. 
In order to understand this massive web of a story and its implications, we've got to catch you up to speed on the Duke and his rocky past up to this point. Edward VIII, son of King George V and Queen Mary, was groomed for the English throne since he was a young child. When World War I broke out in 1914, he eagerly joined the infantry regiment of the Grenadier Guards, and despite his status, frequently visited the trenches at the front lines. A few years into the war, on leave from the Western Front, Edward took to partying and struck up multiple romances, most with married women. His father, George V, disapproved of his son's behavior and was outspoken in not wanting him to inherit the crown. When King George V died in 1936, Edward commanded the throne anyway, and against all tradition and counsel, was dead set on marrying a two-time divorcee, an American named Wallace Simpson. Breaking such a custom as king and being the head of the Church of England, he and his advisors both knew that the people would never accept her as a queen. Edward decided upon the advice of his family and Winston Churchill to abdicate and let the throne pass to his younger brother, now George VI. Relations between the royal family and Edward became even more tumultuous following the abdication, and he and his wife were effectively shunned and barred from returning to Great Britain. Exiled from the kingdom he used to rule, Edward VIII, now the Duke of Windsor and his wife, traveled to Germany on the invitation of Adolf Hitler. The two were received as royals and quickly became friends with the likes of Ernan Göring and the Führer himself, even staying at his personal mountain retreat in the Alps, all while the Germans were preparing for war. When World War II broke out, it's no secret that the Duke publicly supported appeasement with the Nazis. Hell, he even did a worldwide radio broadcast calling for it. What the public didn't know was that there was a lot more going on behind the scenes. See, what no one knows is that the Duke actually struck up a private deal with Hitler. In exchange for war intelligence, as well as using his influence to outwardly work towards an official policy of the British becoming non-belligerent, Hitler promised Edward that he would make him and his wife the leaders of Nazi-allied Britain. Now, when it was time for Edward to hold up his end of the bargain, he got cold feet. The Duke and Duchess fled to Portugal in hopes of staying away from everything that was happening, where they stayed with Ricardo de Espirito Santo Silva, a banker with ties to the Nazis. Hitler, wanting to avoid a major invasion of Britain if possible, launched a secret operation codenamed Operation Willie in order to get Edward into Spain. The country was technically non-belligerent, but supported the Nazis nonetheless. There, the Duke would be in Axis territory, where Hitler believed Edward, away from the reach of the royal family and under the safety of the territory, would be convinced to hold up his end of the bargain. In order to make this happen, Hitler sent Miguel Primo de Rivera, the son of a former dictator of Spain and friend of the Duke, to bring Edward on a hunting trip to Spain. There, the two of them would be informed that British Secret Service was planning on assassinating the Duke, making him stay in Spain. Right before de Rivera arrived in Portugal, the royal family, believing the Duke to be a liability and wanting to get him as far away from the war as possible, appointed the Duke as governor of the Bahamas, an action that Edward saw as lifelong banishment from his former home. Edward was informed via telegram that he was to leave for the Bahamas immediately, and therefore didn't go on the hunting trip that was a part of the plan to get him into Spain. Hearing the news that Edward was to go to the Bahamas, Hitler sent a last-ditch effort in the form of Walter Schellenberg, an agent of the Nazi Secret Service, to kidnap the Duke and bring him into Spain. Nonetheless, it was too late. On August 1st, 1940, the same day that he had left for the Bahamas, Germany launched the Luftwaffe in a full-on assault of the British Air Force. Hitler knew that the original deal with Edward was dead. A man who was king and a member of the royal family supporting a foreign enemy was way too much pressure on him. The Duke could not make a deal with the Nazis and tarnish the legacy of the royal family, but now that he was banished halfway across the world and free from prying eyes, Hitler, who had already had supporters in the Bahamas, believed the Duke would play a major role in his plan as the new governor, and that's exactly what he did. Later, the new governor and his lady welcomed members of the press in the gardens of Government House. To the question, do you think it in keeping with the purposes of your appointment to be referred to as Goodwill Ambassador to the Western Hemisphere, His Royal Highness replies, While Great Britain has employed me in this role in the past, I very much doubt that the British government has it in mind at the present 
that my official activities should extend beyond the confines of the Bahama Islands. Perhaps one of the most powerful Nazi supporters in the Bahamas was a Swedish businessman by the name of Axel Wenergren, who became one of the richest men in the world by investing in industrial vacuums adapted for domestic use, as well as developing weapons for all nations during the war. He was a close friend of the Duke, as well as Ernst Göring, one of the top leaders of the Nazi SS. Wenergren was a major asset for the Germans. He supplied all kinds of weapons acting as the frontman for the industrial conglomerate Krupp, used his national influence to keep Sweden neutral during the war, and financed the Nazis through his Bank of the Bahamas, as well as acting as an on-site financier of Nazi archaeological digs and treasure hunts. On September 3, 1939, Wenergren's yacht, the Southern Cross, was just a couple miles away from where the passenger ship, called the SS Athenia, was attacked by a German U-boat. The Athenia was reportedly running blacked out and on a zigzag pattern, which looked like an enemy vessel to the U-boat captain, Fritz Julius Lemp. The submarine fired a torpedo and sank the ship, killing 117 people aboard. Being so close to the attack, reluctantly, Wenergren used his yacht to rescue survivors. His wife, Margaret, was asked by a friend how the Southern Cross happened to be in the vicinity of the sinking ship. She's quoted saying, I had a dream that a ship would be sunk in that spot and ordered the captain to sail there. British and American intelligence didn't buy that and instead thought that the Southern Cross was fueling and supplying the U-boats. Wenergren's assets in Nassau were frozen and he was economically blacklisted from doing business in either country. To circumvent the blacklisting and probable criminal prosecution, Wenergren fled to Mexico. Back in the Bahamas, the Duke had to order the seizure of his business as a way to save face, but often would meet with his banished friend on Norman's Island and talk business as well. Wenergren was still working behind the scenes and now being in Mexico, worked with his friend Maximino Camacho, brother of the president of Mexico to launder Nazi seized foreign money through a fake investment firm called Banco Continental. Wenergren made his services available to the Duke and all the Bay Street boys where they jumped at the opportunity. Every single one of them was actively committing treason and if one of them fell, they all would come crashing down. This is why the murder of Sir Harry Oakes was so important. Christie going down for this meant mutually assured destruction for the rest of this powerful group. And when the police chief came to the Duke to give him the news, Edward knew that he had to eliminate the threat or the entire fabric of international relations could be shifted. The Bay Street Boys, the Mafia, and the Nazis were now interconnected through the bank in Mexico, with the Duke right in the center. A member of the royal family found guilty of conspiracy and treason would create a ripple effect with unprecedented consequences, especially in a world at war with itself. Few options left, the Duke and his wife decided that for the investigation, they would bring in detectives whose loyalties could be bought for the right price. He called up a man by the name of Captain Eddie Melchin from the Miami Police Department and told him to get on the first flight to Nassau. The Duke had become good friends with Melchin after using him as a driver and bodyguard whenever he and the Duchess would visit South Florida, and knew that he could be trusted. Melchin brought along Captain James Otto Barker, and together these two cops from the Miami Police Department had the job of making Oak's murder look like a suicide. However, now that Eddie and Depew, the owner of the Nassau Tribune, had already launched a story about the murder, Edward decided that the only other course of action was to frame someone else for the crime. And who better than the man he hated most, Count Alfred de Marigny. As a flamboyant Frenchman, de Marigny was already seen as an outsider to the Bay Street Boys. His actions were seen as a direct affront to the morals of the aristocracy that ruled the Bahamas. He was twice divorced and spent his time racing around on his yacht known as the Concubine. His third marriage was done in secret to Nancy Oakes, Sir Harry's daughter, just three days after her 18th birthday. Furthermore, Freddie dug a well on his estate and provided the impoverished locals with free and clean water. When a wealthy Englishwoman built a house next to his, she asked him to sell her water, and he declined, telling her to dig her own well. He also ran a chicken farm and would work side by side with his black employees, angering those who looked down upon Bahamian locals as second-class citizens. In the early days of the war, Freddie even made trips into Germany with forged documents to smuggle out the relatives of his Jewish friends and was the only person to rent vacation property to Jews in the Bahamas. The Duke held a personal grudge against Amerigny, and in one of their run-ins, Freddie told the Duke that he was nothing more than the pimple on the ass of the British Empire. The last straw was when Freddie, against the wishes of the Duke, 
took in Nazi prison camp escapees who had come ashore from Devil's Island, sheltering and employing them in the Bahamas. Back at Westbourne, the scene of the murder, Edward and his wife, Wallace, met upstairs privately with the two cops sent from Miami. After the ensuing conversation, the Duke, now given the perfect opportunity to rid himself and the Bay Street Boys of the thorn in their side that was Demerigny, set into motion the biggest cover-up the islands have ever seen. So they set about trying to frame Demerigny. They call him in for an interview there at Westbourne, the mansion where Oaks lived. And meanwhile, they had set up no crime scene perimeter, no security. Uh, the public uh, was curious as all get out. They were wandering around, picking up things, looking at things, taking souvenirs. But they take DeMarinay upstairs for two hours, interview him, and he's got a very tight alibi and no motive. But nonetheless, when they come downstairs, Barker instructs Sergeant Sears of the Royal Bahamian Police, arrest Alfred DeMarinay for the murder of Harry Oakes. After Freddie was arrested, and only three days before the trial, the Duke put in an immediate transfer for Police Commissioner Erskine Lindop, one of the first officers on the scene of the Oaks murder, to be sent to Trinidad and Tobago, stifling any chance the commissioner would be cross-examined by the defense. When I talked to one of the elder police officers still living and retired in the Bahamas, a Captain Colin Frazier, and Captain Frazier, when I asked him if he had known Erskine Lindop, said, oh yes, knew him well. And I said, did Urshan Lindop ever talk about a murder that had occurred in the Bahamas before he came here? And Captain Frazier said, oh yes. He says, he talked incessantly about that damned murder. He said the Duke had transferred him here because he, Erskine Lindop, had told the Duke that he would not allow an innocent man to hang. With the trial now underway, Bay Street boy heavyweight Stafford Sands, the most powerful attorney in the islands, not to mention Harold Christie's uncle, got to work on the prosecution. Fortunately for Freddie, those involved in the cover-up were so dead set on framing him that they got tunnel vision and overlooked crucial pieces needed to convict the man and put him on death row. They insisted that Freddie committed the murder to get access to Oakes' fortune through his daughter. However, Oakes had put in his will that none of his children could inherit a cent until they turned 35, almost twice the age that Nancy was at the time. The prosecution also insisted that the recent singed hairs on Demergny's arm and eyebrows proved that he lit the fire in Oakes' bedroom. However, in his concrete alibi, the defense had proven that the singed hairs were from lighting a lamp that flared up while at dinner. His alibi was so tight that it only allowed 15 minutes of time unaccounted for not nearly enough to commit the murder in the way it had been done. All this being said, the prosecution still had an ace up their sleeve, Freddie's fingerprint at the scene of the crime. The problem with the lift as it was presented in court was that the fingerprint on the lift was wider than the strip where Barker testified that it had come from. Furthermore, the fingerprint on the lift did not have any of the background noise, wood grain or the Chinese silk pattern, none of that. The pattern on the background of the lift were perfect concentric circles. And a very common drinking glass used during that time period had painted circles on it. I have taken lifts from this glass myself where the circles will show up in exactly the same uh, manner that the circles on that lift that they use in court show up. So it's conclusive evidence, at least to me as a fingerprint expert, that the lift presented in court could not have come from that Chinese dressing screen, but had to have come from a surface like a drinking glass very popular during that time period and in all likelihood was a glass used by Melton and Barker uh, during that interview. 
Ultimately, the jury didn't have enough evidence to justify a conviction, and Marini was found not guilty of murder. But it was recommended that he be deported from the islands on the basis that he was an undesirable character. The expenses of the trial had left Freddy completely destitute, but he still had his dignity. Instead of waiting for the Duke to officially deport him, De Marigny took Nancy with him on a borrowed sailboat to Havana, Cuba, where they stayed with none other than Ernest Hemingway, a man Freddy became friends with on a cruise from London to New York, where they would shoot skeet off the deck of the boat. While there, Nancy had a secret affair with Hemingway's oldest son, and after a year, eventually abandoned both he and Freddy, moved to Canada, and married a pilot of the Royal Air Force. Even though she hired one of the world's best private detectives for more than a million dollars, and stood by Freddy during the trial through time, disillusionment, and the pain of having her life uprooted, she actually believed that Freddy killed her father and couldn't stand to be with him. She had her lawyers annul the marriage and ruined what little Freddy had left by charges of moral turpitude. The Marigny was now so broke that he was forced to sell his own blood for food money. It wasn't until years later that he was able to remarry and move to Texas, where he met Pat Wertheim, who told us Freddy was very wealthy in his later years. Interestingly enough, Freddy allegedly printed counterfeit money for enemies of the US in Cuba, while simultaneously working as an informant for the CIA, playing both sides and getting rich in the middle of it all. Back in the Bahamas, with Freddy out of the picture, the Bay Street boys and their treasonous dealings were in the clear. When Oakes died, all the money he was secretly funneling through Banco Continental in Mexico was just sitting there. No one but Christie, the Duke, Camacho, and Wenergren knew about it. And with Wenergren gone and Oakes dead, the three remaining men split Oakes' fortune under the table. Christie was now able to accomplish his work of turning the Bahamas into the ultimate resort destination, like the one we know today. And the Duke, who spent an inordinate amount of money as governor in the Bahamas, returned to England after the war with more money than he had when he first left. This fact was confirmed to us through a person who wished to remain anonymous but had proof of direct access to the financial dealings of the royal family at the time. All of our investigating into the murder of Sir Harry Oakes begged the question, just how far did this cover-up go? I called a friend of mine at the Miami Police Department and asked them if they had any internal files on the Oaks murder that Melkin and Barker had been involved in. And my friend said, well, let me check and see. And he calls me back about an hour later. And he says, it turns out we have two complete record file boxes of documents uh, related to that case. And they're in our archives warehouse. And I said, if you can get access for me to that warehouse to look at those files, I will be on the next plane to Miami. And he said, let me check and see what I can do. And I didn't hear back from him for about two days. And finally he calls me back and he says, Pat, you've stirred up a firestorm over here. He said, those boxes don't exist. They have disappeared from the warehouse. And I'm thinking, okay, did the mafia get in there and remove them? Did J. Edgar Hoover get in there and remove them? I mean, he had a penchant for gathering blackmail material on anybody he could. What happened to those file boxes? I called a friend of mine at the FBI, uh, a section chief of one of the sections at the time. And I asked him, I said, uh, there was a 1943 homicide down in the Bahamas that I'm kind of interested in. Could you check and see if the FBI has a file on this case? And he said, Pat, that file has, uh, has a seal on it. It has a hundred year seal on it for national security purposes. I can't talk about it. And I said, in other words, the information in that file would be so embarrassing to the British government that even today it could jeopardize US-British relations. And again, a long, drawn-out pause, and he says, you're very perceptive, Pat. I'm sure that after the year 2043, MI6's files or MI5's and FBI's will all be thrown open, and by then, it probably won't matter anymore, and I certainly won't be around to see it. Well, what if I told you that we got access to that MI5 file? Did you? 
<laughs> How heavily redacted is it? Wow. Even being some of the few in the world to ever see this file from MI5, we felt as if we had more questions now than ever. The agents assigned to this case back in the day had every reason to want to protect the Duke and his dealings. While we were given early access to a file previously redacted and sealed for nearly a hundred years, we have no way of knowing if they left anything out, and it's pretty safe to assume they did. The deeper we went down the rabbit hole of this whole thing, the more connections we found. Every question answered would just lead to two more taking its place. Like Sisyphus, we climbed the hill to finish our task, only to see the stone roll back down the mountain. So what I didn't expect when we got here to Nassau is that the entire place is littered with symbols of Freemasonry. So the Freemasons are known for having a lot of secrets, they're a secret society, but what a lot of people don't know is that when you join the Masons, you take a blood oath that says if you share the secrets of Masonry, you get your throat slit from ear to ear. We were told that the Masons here specifically have a lot of secrets within the community. And it was crazy. When we were driving to our hotel, our taxi driver, you know, she's pointing out all the sites and everything, and she points to these luxury uh, outlets, and she goes, that's a front for the Masons. And I was like, what are you talking about? And I mean, we, we passed by earlier, and there was an armed guard outside, and it's, it's hard to say what uh, the Masons are doing nowadays in Nassau, um, but it's clear that they have a lot of wealth and they have some influence. You see there? The Grand Mason. You see it? Yeah. Yeah, that. They say, you see what here in Nassau? <laughs> the Grand Master. Elf of the world, the greatest secret, those guys. And they have it right here. When, anytime you see some of those guys with the tattoo, they have the tattoo on their left arm. Grand Mason, they don't talk nothing. You can't talk nothing. Nothing, nothing. Well, yes, secretive, very secretive. We got to the Bahamas thinking we knew the whole story. As we walked the streets of Nassau, particularly the once illustrious Bay Street, signs and symbols seemed to keep suggesting that a story even bigger than we imagined was lying just beneath the surface. Eager to discover what we might be missing in this murder case, we couldn't help but notice that Bay Street in particular was screaming the presence of Freemasonry. Obelisks, solar icons, and even the famous square and compass littered Bay Street leading up to what was a very large, and as we found out, a very active Masonic Lodge. But what could that possibly have to do with the Bay Street Boys and the endeavors of Harry Oaks and Harold Christie? After deep diving Bahamian history, Masonic encyclopedias, and the heritage of many of our key players, we found an unbelievable amount of previously unknown information to substantiate our theory. As we dug and dug, the difficulty became not proving that Freemasonry was integral to this story, but instead finding at what point it actually stopped. For those that might not know, Freemasonry is a mystical and secret society, replete with ancient rituals and an unknown origin. While some date Freemasonry to the 18th century in England or Scotland, others date Masonry all the way back to the Old Testament of the Bible. Although it is often hard to separate what is fact and fiction when discussing Masonry, the list of known Masonic brothers is equally astounding. Known Freemasons of U.S. fame include names like George Washington, Teddy Roosevelt, Andrew Jackson, J. Edgar Hoover, Ben Franklin, and hundreds of other famous names covering the history books. Of the 24 official and known members of the Bay Street Boys, at least 17 of them were known Freemasons, including major players like attorney and politician Stafford Sands, land magnate Guy Baxter, and the premier of the Bahamas, Roland Simonet. Not only this, but many of the Bay Street Boys had both influential fathers and sons who became Freemasons, like former Deputy Prime Minister Brett Simonet, or Sovereign Grand Commander of the Freemasons, Basil L. Sands. The Bay Street Boys during the 1940s owned 80% of the Bahamas land, made up the entirety of the ruling political party known as the UBP, were industry leaders who built the nation from the ground up, and all of them happened to be brothers of the same Masonic Lodge right there on Bay Street. Calling this group of men the Bay Street Boys is a perfect example of the Bahamian public seeing a group of powerful individuals working together to further each other's ends without realizing what the source of their collaboration was. The power structure of the Bahamas was inseparable from Freemasonry, with its brother Masons controlling the island's every function in order to make themselves richer and gain more power. What the Bay Street Boys did not expect, though, was that they would be visited by a famous brother from another country. Edward VIII loved Freemasonry. He wrote that it was one of the most influential forces in his life, 
and was even initiated as a Masonic Grand Master. In his short time as king, Edward even loved Freemasonry so much that he refused to resign from his Masonic duties as a king normally would. He was undoubtedly pleased to find upon his banishment to the Bahamas that he would be right at home amongst his Masonic brothers in a lodge that dominated the Bahamas. The secret sauce of Freemasonry that makes it so beneficial for doing business is their secrets and how they keep them. At every degree of initiation, Freemasons take oaths of loyalty to their brothers, and oaths to keep the secrets of their brothers secret forever. These oaths are protected by a penalty of a gruesome death, and this Masonic death penalty for sharing secrets has been acted on many times before. When combining the resources, connections, political power, and trust signed in blood that the Bay Street Boys and King Edward VIII could count on during their time in the Bahamas, they were able to oversee the creation of a multifaceted plan to gain power, money, and global influence. Although much of this plan operated in secret, here is what we know. The Bay Street Boys used their control of the United Bahamian Party to rule that Bahamian politicians could make money through other business ventures while still controlling legislation on the island. This allowed them to continue to be the dominant industry leaders on the island, both legal and illegal, while setting course for ventures in the future. While controlling the building operations on the island, the Bay Street Boys set out to bring a large casino and resort venture onto what is now Paradise Island, with mobster Meyer Lansky to be a major financier and partner. The real estate would be purchased from the Bay Street Boys as they were the major owners of land. The construction contracts would stay internal and be given to the Bay Street Boys in order to cut costs and maintain ownership. Much of the profits of this business venture would go towards funding the Nazi war effort through major Nazi ally Axel Wenergren's Bank of the Bahamas, and then would be funneled into Maximino Camacho's secret banking operation called Banco Continental in Mexico. During the heat of World War II, it was illegal for England and its colonies to funnel money internationally, making this entire operation a coordinated effort of treason on behalf of England's former king and many of its prominent citizens. But why did the Bay Street Boys and King Edward go to so much effort to fund Hitler? After all, England was busy fighting Nazi Germany at the very moment these Englishmen are funding their enemies. Why help their cause? The answer is more complex than you think. Edward had already been told by Hitler that a Nazi victory in World War II would allow him to return to the throne of England, an outcome he yearned for after being disgraced by his family and countrymen in front of the world only years before. As a disgraced former king, England's occupation by Nazi Germany would allow Edward the revenge he desired on those who mocked him and would put him in the position of authority he felt he deserved. It is very likely that Edward guaranteed his Freemason brothers and business partners, the Bay Street Boys, that they would be put in large governmental positions of power when he was brought to the throne after a Nazi war victory, which gave the Bay Street Boys plenty of incentive to also funnel their money to the Fuhrer. Not only down in the Bahamas, but it seems many Freemasons may have even had the same idea in America. High degree Freemasons in the United States were funding and assisting Hitler's war effort at the same time as the Bay Street Boys. Maybe you've even heard of these guys. They go by names like William Randolph Hearst, Prescott Bush, and even Henry Ford. These men were adored by Hitler as they helped him go from nobody to a major political force. Hitler even had a portrait of Henry Ford on his desk. Though the precise nature of these financial contributions could not possibly be disclosed, you can be certain these powerful men made these contributions expecting that Adolf Hitler would bring them significant returns on their investment. The Bay Street Boys were the gods of the Bahamas and got richer and more powerful by the day. That is until Harry Oaks started getting in the way. The truth is, Harry Oaks didn't fit in from the day he landed in the Bahamas. A humble and honest man from Maine who had to work to make his fortune, Harry Oaks was a far cry from the Bay Street Boys whose power and influence was their birthright from the powerful families who had been controlling the Bahamas through their control of politics, industry, and reciprocal business deals for generations. The Bay Street Boys got greedy when they saw Harry Oaks and the bankrolls at his disposal and were anxious to add him to their syndicate without thinking whether or not he would go along with their plans. When Harry Oaks threatened to call in all of his exorbitant loans to Harold Christie, he likely saw it as a powerful negotiation tactic to show Christie and the Bay Street Boys that he wouldn't be scammed or pushed around. Unfortunately for Harry Oaks, it seems that he had no idea what he was putting himself up against. This was no group of business partners and dinner buddies. Harry Oaks was making business threats to a dangerous organization of major mafia players, rum runners, politicians, Nazi financiers, an ancient secret society bound in blood, 
and the King of England who had no reservations committing treason against his very own country. A newcomer in a world where he thought only money talked, Harry Oakes made the mistake of thinking he was the biggest dog in the yard, and it was the last mistake he would ever make. In wake of all of the secrecy still surrounding these events, we needed more answers, and what better place to investigate than the long-abandoned Darby Island, where Harry Oakes was crossed for the last time. Controlled by Bay Street Boys land mogul Guy Baxter, and miles offshore from any civilization, Darby Island is ripe with mysteries waiting to be uncovered in its ruins. Darby Island in the middle of the Exumas. We're about to look for the infamous castle. This is where our story starts and where our story ends. So we just got off the boat. Uh, we swam the shore and now we're scouting for the path that leads to the castle. Let's do it. Let's go. We think we found the path, um, but we're gonna have to cut through a lot of brush. So let's see how it goes. This has to be it. No, but there's really old ones. This is it, boys. We're doing it. Woo! Ouch. Okay, so we've been walking about uh, a little over an hour. It's really thick jungle. Uh, got cuts all over. Should have brought a machete. There's a lot of vines, a lot of trees. But uh, we just passed the Darby Island airstrip, and so this is the home stretch before we get in to see the castle. Let's go. Yeah, Sunday. let's finish it. All right, so we stumbled upon what looks to be some kind of uh, entrance to a cave. Um, allegedly, Sir Guy Baxter, when he was on the island, would um, help U-boat crewmen um, hide them in, in the cave system of the island. So either this collapsed and caved in or someone didn't want us to see what was down there all right we're just about the two hour mark it's hot we're soaked but we made it we're about to make the trek inside the castle let's go i'm never hiking in shorts again no holy shit holy shit i don't know how to read wow I'm so on edge right now, dude. <laughs> I'm just waiting for something to like jump out, dude. This must be the front. Front entrance, yeah. Imagine back in the day, man, having your own private island. All the richest guys in the world just walking up these steps, coming in. Who knows what they were doing? Bringing yeah, in honestly. U boat captains right up these steps, having them in for dinner with a roaring fire. Right under the nose of the allies and everyone. No one had any, any idea. Let's go upstairs. So, we don't know where, we don't know where precisely, but sometime during the 1980s, someone came to this house and found a stash of explosives here. In the basement. Okay, yeah. okay. 
Um, it can mean any number of things. It yeah. Can mean they were blowing up the caves. It can mean they were giving the explosives to the U-boats. Like, you know, who knows? Alright, this collapses. I think you'll be alright. Check this out. Check this out. Wow. 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 <laughs> I can't believe this, dude. I can't believe we're here. the opposite side of the island. Wow. Oh my god, man. This is so worth it, man. So worth it. See the walls cracking, like yeah. the giant crack. At the, so the foundation is likely cracked. And obviously, we heard the rumor that MI5 came and blew up the mooring for the U-boats. That could have just as easily been blowing up the caves that we saw over there. Yeah. Um, you know, who knows? Potentially, the stash of explosives could have been from MI5. I don't want to throw out too many guesses. Yeah, no one can know when this is all going to collapse. So we're seeing it you know, as close as we can to uh, what it originally looked like. The only people that are going to know about it are the Bahamian residents who were old enough to either have their parents know about it or they themselves know about it. But eventually, word about this is just going to die and it'll be like this never happened. That probably goes down to the basement. Because it would take some major reclamation to like bring this house back. I mean, honestly, dude, it's probably fucked. Can you imagine, yeah, can you imagine if someone was able to restore this? Oh, it'd be incredible. This, you know, this is... This is like Neo-Victorian architecture, man. Dude. Oh, yeah. Dude. Okay, okay. Is this a hatch down in the basement? I think that's a hatch down in the basement. There's also what looks to be a hatch on the side as well. And like we said, there was a guy here Dude. in the 80s who found explosives, man. Do you think this is like a manhole? Like a smuggling people. Or to escape. Fuck, dude. <laughs> Fuck, dude. Okay, let's check out this hole too. Let's see if we can see see down there. That basement. Dude. I wish we had a rope or something. It's probably who knows if it's down there, man. The last thing we want is to get stuck, but here's the concern. We just don't have enough gear. Guy Baxter was likely a Freemason. Freemasons do a lot of ancient rituals, often that involve blood, often that involve maybe simulated sacrifice. So having a basement like this could serve two purposes. One, smuggling people. We already talked about the fact that he was helping a lot of the U-boat crewmen, but it's also possible that this could be a place maybe for Freemason initiation, maybe for the Bay Street Boys, tough to say. Obviously, there's a lot we could speculate on, but if we can't get down there, we can't oh, shit. be certain. I mean, it's so remote, like anything could have gone down at this on this right. island in general. Right. Wow. Dude, this is history right here. I never would have imagined that we would be here. It's incredible. Okay, so we followed another path and it led us to a massive Dude, look at this. Oh my god, is there, are those bats? Those are bats. Holy fuck. Dude, those are all bats. Holy whoa, 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 whoa. Ah. Dude, I don't I don't know if you got that. 
there is at least like 200 bats on that ceiling. We're gonna try not to be too loud because if the bats scramble, this is gonna be an absolute mess, but we will see what happens. You need a cage barbed. right underneath. Yeah, it's barbed too. So were they keeping something out or keeping something in? Yeah. That's the question. These secret events that are coordinated by powerful groups happen behind the scenes every single day. As members of the public, we participate in these operations without knowing and only find out about these happenings decades after they take place, if we are willing to do a mountain of research. The Bay Street Boys we discussed in this film may be long gone, but their influence is still felt to this day. Although the United Bahamian Party was eventually overtaken by Lyndon Pendling's free national movement, many of the Bay Street Boys' descendants have found a way of maintaining their control of industry and politics. In 2017, Bahamian Deputy Prime Minister Philip Davis warned Bahamians about the Bay Street Boys' continued influence over the Bahamas. Davis warned that the Bahamians should be wary of Bay Street Boy descendant Brett Seminent's re-entry into politics. Davis said, They try to present themselves differently this time. This time they say it's the people's time. I don't think they mean regular Bahamians. When they say that it's the people's time, they can't be talking to us ordinary Bahamians. Which people do you think they are talking about? To me, I see the Bay Street Boys. That's what I see. Who do you see back there? Brett Simonet. He's back. He sensed a weak leader, and he thinks it's his time to get in. While he was in retirement, he was like the buzzard hovering, waiting for the carcass to lay out. And now he sees the carcass is sputtering. He is now landing. That's why he's back, after saying he was resigning from politics. Now you know how he got there, and now you know how he goes. Deputy Prime Minister Roland Simonet has been nothing short of brotherly to the Freemasons during this time. In a speech given in 2009, Simonet said to the Masons, You could serve as a conduit to the government on national issues. Once you establish your collective force, the government would be obliged to at least consider our collective position. After hailing the Masons' rich history and powerful connections, Simonet said, Your fraternity is avowed to cohesiveness, brotherly obligations, and unity. Melting these ideas into a single social initiative would effectively and successfully propel the development of our Bahamas. And develop it they have. The Bahamas is currently in the middle of the largest development project it has ever undertaken, known as Vision 2040 a multi-decade development, governance, and infrastructural plan to modernize and strengthen the Bahamas economically. This plan on paper lists its goal as raising the quality of life for all Bahamian citizens. But with the Bahamas' history of hidden groups going to any lengths to gain power, and the re-emergence of the Bay Street Boys through their descendants, one can only wonder who is really in charge of this plan, and who will be the true beneficiary of Vision 2040 once it's completed. Throughout all this, one thing remains certain. The powerful families who control the Bahamas behind the scenes have survived for almost two centuries, and they won't be going anywhere anytime soon.